That's the stream. Oh, oh, now it's streaming. streaming. Let's turn. Let's turn. Let's turn. Let's Let's turn. Let's Thank you. 
ಮಧುರಿ ಗೋಸ್ವತಿ ರಾಧಾಕುಂಡಂ ಗಿರಿ ಬರಂ ಮಹೋ ರಾಧಿಕಮಧಾವಸಂ ಪ್ರಾಪ್ತಯಶ್ಚ ಪ್ರತಿಗ್ರೀಪಾಯ ಶ್ರೀಗುರು ತಂ ನ ತಸ್ಮೇ ವಂಚಕಲ್ಪತರೂಪ್ಯಸ್ಥಾಕೃಪಾಸಿಂಧುಭ್ಯತೀತಾನ ಪವಾನೇಭ್ಯೋ ವೈಷ್ಣವೇಭ್ಯ ನಮೋ ನಮಃ ನಿಖಿಲಾಶ್ರತಿ ಮೌಲೆ ರತ್ನಮಾಲದಿತಿ ನಿರಾಜಿತ ಪದಪಂಕಜಂತ ಆಜೀ ಮುಕ್ತಕುಲೈರುಪಶ್ಯಾಮ ಪರಿತಸ್ತ ಹರಿ ಸಂಶ್ರಯಾಮಿ ಅನಾರಿತಚರಿ ಚಿರಕರುಣಯಾವತೀರ್ನಾಕಲ ಶ್ಮಾರ್ಪಯಿತ ಬಲರಾಸಂ ಸ್ವಭಕ್ತಿ ಶ್ರಿಯ ಹರೀಪುರತಸುಂದರಾದ್ಯೂತಿ ಕದಂಬಸುಂದೀಪಿ ಸದಾ ಹರಿದ ಕಂದರೆ ಸ್ಫುರತೋ ವಾಸಿ ನಂದನಾ ಜಾನುಲಂಬಿತ ಭುಜೋ ಕನಕಾವದಾ ಸಂಕೀರ್ತನೈಕಿತರೂ ಕಮಲಾಯತಕ್ಷು ವಿಶ್ವಾಂಬರೋ ದ್ವಿಜಾಬರೋ ಜುಗಧರ್ಮಪಾಲು ವಂದೇ ಜಗತ್ಪ್ರಿಯಕರೋ ಕರುಣಾವತಾರು ಲಾದಿನಿ ಶಕ್ತಿಸ್ವರೂಪಾಯ ಗೌರಂಗಸ್ವರಿದಾಯ ಭಕ್ತಶಕ್ತಿ ಪ್ರದನಾಯ ಕದಾಧರ ನಮಸ್ತುತೆ ಹೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಕರುಣಾ ಸಿಂಧೋ ದೀನ ಬಂಧೋ ಜಗತ್ಪತಿ ಗೋಪೇಶ ಗೋಪೀಕಾ ಕಂತ ರಾಧಾ ಕಂತ ನಮಸ್ತುತೆ ರಾಧೆ ಬೃಂದವನಾಧೀಶೆ ಕರುಣಮೃತವಾಹಿನಿ ಕೃಪಯಾ ನಿಜ ಪಾದ ದರ್ಶನ್ ಮಹ್ಯಂ ಪ್ರದೀಯತ ಭಕ್ತ ಅಪರಾಧಲಕ್ಷಾಯ ಕ್ಷಿಪ್ತಕಮಾಧಿತರಂಗಮಾಧ್ಯೆ ಕೃಪಾ ಮಯಿತ ಶರಣ ಪ್ರಪಾನ ವೃಂದೇ ಮಸ್ತೆ ಚರಣಾರವಿಂದ ವೃಂದೇ ಮಸ್ತೆ ಚರಣಾರವಿಂದ ಶಿಲಾ ಗುರುದೇವ್ ಕಿ ಜಯ ಶ್ರೀಮನ್ ಮಹಾಪ್ರಭು ಕಿ ಜಯ ಶ್ರೀ ಶ್ರೀ ಜಗನ್ನಾಥ ಬಾಲದೇವ್ ಸುಭಾದ್ರಿ ಕಿ ಜಯ ಶ್ರೀ ಗಿರಿರಾಜ್ ಮಹಾರಾಜ್ ಕಿ ಜಯ ಶ್ರೀ ಹರಿ ನಾಮ ಸಂಕೀರ್ತನ್ ಕಿ ಜಯ ಶ್ರೀ ಏಕಾದಶಿ ಕಿ ಜಯ ಗೋರ್ ಭಕ್ತ ವೃಂದ ಕಿ ಜಯ ಗೋರ್ ಪ್ರಿಮಾನ್ ಹರಿ ಸೊ ಗುಡ್ ಮಾರ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಆಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಯು ಪ್ರಣಾಮ್ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ಸ್ ಸೋ ಮಚ್ ಫಾರ್ ಕಮಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಆಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಯು ಆಲ್ಸೋ ಕನೆಕ್ಟೆಡ್ ಆನ್ಲೈನ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಟುಡೇ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಹ್ಯಾವಿಂಗ್ at least today in the morning in the evening we will continue with our series of on brahma stuti the prayers of brahma but but today in the morning we will have istagosti which basically means getting together gosti getting together group meeting with ista no, with the our deity in the center getting together for the sake of our deity if you want to put it like that <laughs> that that's how sanskrit words interesting which in practice means uh interaction questions and answers in connection to to the idea of hmm, to the idea of how to better increase our service disposition towards bhagavan so all of you are invited to present questions that you may have topics you may like to to hear about to discuss because this is basically the one of the main methods that we can that we find in our tradition hmm? questions and answers you find that in the bhagavad gita krishna arjun in the bhagavatam parikshit and sukadev and so many other sessions in the bhagavad and questions and answers chaitanya charitamrita ramananda roy mahaprabhu over and over again this this dynamics uh of learning are, are presented and especially when we have something specific um by presenting a question that will also show where we are basically standing because ideally we are asking something according to our adhikar 
that's the idea. We will ask something that is relevant and pertinent to our particular stage. So some specific answer can come in that regard. So are there any questions, any topics, something you may like to hear about? But also the ones connected online can share them in the, in the thread and we can address them. Who? Yeah, bye. I have a question. Um, I actually have uh, two questions. Hope it's okay because I think the first one might be a very quick answer. But I'll... You never know. <laughs> <laughs> um, the first question, uh, Justin really said that Brahma, uh, you, you know, Hana, Lila, mm. and, and Brahma having the realization, and it ultimately culminates in him taking birth as Haridas Thakur in uh, Chaitanya Lila. And my question, this is the quick one, is um, when he took, when Brahma took birth as Haridas uh, Thakur, did um, some other uh, uh, person take over the post of Brahma, or was there some under other arrangement how, how that happened? And my other question, um, I, I had a question if you could maybe speak a little bit about pride, um, because um, it's such a hard thing to overcome. And um, in my experience, so I'm talking about my own experience, of course, um, uh, and you had mentioned something in a class a few days ago, how, which was very helpful, because I think one thing, perspective really can help you to make progress in overcoming pride. And you had mentioned how any good quality we have or any progress we made in devotion is completely based on mercy. So it's nothing we've done. Um, um, but uh, but it's just that pride can have such an effect on uh, your everyday actions. You know, the stereotypical thing of you get a compliment and you, you're, you know, your pride runs away so quickly. And, um, and also in the negative aspect, you're afraid that your pride will be damaged. So you can act timid or something, or not maybe not the stereotypical way of being boastful, and but still you're being kind of pulled by your pride. So um, it just seems there's so many layers to tackle it and mm -hmm. to take it uh, mm -hmm. away. So I just didn't know if you had some recommendations of practice or um, uh, how to, or the more perspective to, to help with that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks so much for the questions. Regarding the first question, actually one devotee made the exact same question in uh, Michigan, oh. the Harmony Collective, when we were visiting there some, whatever, one month ago, because we were also sharing some some Brahma Stuti uh, verses based on some of the Stuti there. So I repeat just in case the question for those who online, maybe I don't know how much they are hearing the question. So the question is, and just to clarify that point, we are going through the prayers of Brahma. Um, Brahma is, it is mentioned that Brahma is born in Gaur Lila as Haridas Thakur. And, and basically, the idea is that what Brahma wanted, wanted to attain, his ideal of perfection was fully possible in the figure of Haridas Thakur in the context of Gaur Lila. As we'd say the other day, Brahma during the Brahma Vimohan Lila, he engaged in a number of apparats, interestingly. He engaged, he offended the form of Krishna by considering this ordinary form at one moment. He offended uh, the associates of Krishna by trying to kidnap them. <laughs> he offended the Lila of Krishna by interrupting the picnic. So he had a, a good list. <laughs> But somehow, although he offended, if you will, Rupa, Guna, Parikar, Lila, all these different aspects, he, the name, the name of Krishna stayed with him, especially in his next birth as Haridas Thakur. And, he, and the name stayed with him quite a lot. No? He became the Nam Acharya. <laughs> so, uh, so that's also an important point in this connection that, of course, I plan to speak in detail when we finish the whole series and we will go to the happy end of the story of Brahma attaining the ultimate perfection as Haridas. And uh, uh, and saying here, the, the lesson for us is even if you commit opera to these other aspects of Bhagavan, the name is most merciful. But of course, be careful of not offending the name on the, on the strength of, oh, the name is so merciful that I can even offend the name and he will stay with me. That's not the best attitude to deal with the name. So, but the point is, even if you fail in so many other directions, names still there and can take give you everything. As is the example of Brahma in the form of Haridas, that we know he attained the ultimate perfection, 
to the point that when he passed away, and that's a whole different discussion, but very interesting one describing Chaitanya Charitamrita, the passing away of Haridas Thakur. I mean, there's a whole chapter dedicated to the passing away of Haridas Thakur. You basically do not find any other description of detailed description of the passing away of anyone in Gorlila. What to speak of a whole chapter about the passing away of someone, but in case of Haridas Thakur, that's highlighted. And as we know, he he's not only accompanied by Mahaprabhu, but Mahaprabhu himself starts to to dance with his body when he passed away. And then he, with his own hands, starts to dig the, how do you say? The samadhi, basically, you know, to make the hole for putting the body there. And on top of that, and he also bathes the body on the ocean in Puri, dancing with him himself. All Mahaprabhu himself is doing. And he's declaring with, like, with four mouths, he's describing he's chanting the glories of Haridas Thakur and how his body is totally spiritual and he wants to make that point by taking it on his arms, dancing with it putting it himself in Samadhi like making this point Diksha Kale Bhaktakari Atma Samarpana Chaitanya Charitamrita says when Hey Kari Krishna Kari At Kari Atma Sam in the moment of Diksha and now this is an interesting way of thinking about what's then Diksha <laughs> See, in the moment of Diksha, when you make of your own Atma, of your own self, a whole offering, a complete offering to Bhagavan, Krishna considers the body of that devotee as equal to his. And Mahaprabhu is showing that in that, that Lila, I'm taking Harya Stakur's body along with him and baby. So implying, of course, Diksha is, is to be taken as a process. No, it's not just, okay, I received Diksha. So what's next now? I already had that. What's the next thing to have? Oh, no, you didn't understand. You have to do something with that. <laughs> Sri Guru gave you, if you will, the seed. You have to do some work with that. It's like if I give you the seed and you ask me, okay, I have the seed. Yes, but the fruit is not there yet. You have to put the seed, have prepared the ground, put the seed. Mahaprabhu gave this example. You have to become a gardener. So eventually, the Bhakti Lata Beach, divine of devotion, the seed that is given, Guru Krishna Prasad, Pai Bhakti Lata Beach, Eventually, that will blossom into the form of prayer and fala or the fruit of divine love. So anyhow, I don't want to get sidetracked by the question, but just giving some context because some, maybe some of the devotees may not know about this connection between Brahma, Haridas. And of course, Brahma is, for example, in Gorganodesh, Deepika and other treatises which kind of show who is who in Gaur Lila and Krishna Lila. Brahma is connected with Haridas. So in the form of Haridas Thakur, Brahma attained his ultimate perfection in Gaur Lila's Haridas Thakur and in Krishna Lila in Sakirasa, which is what he asked for, as we mentioned these days in the beginning of creation. So that said, the question is about, okay, so we hear that Brahma is, I mean, Brahma is a post, right, that someone has to be in for this whole thing to happen, if you will. <laughs> he's instrumental. He's he's not a primary creator, but a secondary creator. Mm -hmm. so I use the term Sarga and Bisarga. So Sarga means Krishna is actually the one who is behind the whole thing, the one who is providing the elements. And Brahma is the one who is making sense of the elements, basically putting them together as the architect of the cosmos, if, to put it very simply. So if Brahma, who, I mean, of course, there is one Brahma, and if Brahma at one point attains perfection, the idea, the question is like, what will happen? I mean, if, if Brahma attained perfection as Haridas Thakur, that happened a few hundreds years ago, we are speaking about one, one particular Brahma. There is one Brahma in each universe, and, and the whole duration of the universe lasts for the lifetime of Brahma. Generally, we have, we have this type of definition that, of course, Brahma's time is different from ours, but the whole duration is like 100 years of Brahma, which for us is a number that we cannot even pronounce. <laughs> it has lots of zeros. <laughs> so the question is, so if Brahma attains perfection and Haridas Thakur, which means he went to Golok, so what happens with Brahma? 
Huh? Is there no more Brahma from that moment till the end of Brahma's life? It seemed that Brahma's life ended before or something. <laughs> so are we without, we, without Brahma, without Architect? And that's why the, go, the, the world is so out of order now. <laughs> so maybe that's the reason. So that's an interesting question. And of course, this has not been like directly that I know no address in Shastra specifically, like what's what's going on. So we can basically conjecture regarding some different possibilities in, in that connection, which I would say, according to what I can say, go in two, goes in two directions. One of them, you can say, okay, Brahma attained perfection and Haridas Thakur. So Bhagavan Vishnu himself and cover the post of Brahma for the time being. Because sometimes we hear when there's nobody qualified to be in the post of Brahma, Vishnu himself is doing that. Because as we say yesterday, you have to be pretty qualified to be Brahma on some level of qualification, 108, 100 lifetimes of perfect Barna Ashram or 108, just in case. <laughs> That's not so easy. So it may be difficult at at the particular moment, I have no candidates this time. So Vishnu himself mm -hmm. does that. When there's nobody as qualified as Brahma, to, as to be a Brahma. And we could say, or oh, when Brahma gets too qualified <laughs> and becomes Haridas Thakur and attends Golok, Vishnu enters and fills the, the void for the time, the remaining time. That's, that's one way of putting that. Or another way of putting that will be that still that Brahma... He attained perfection as Haridas Thakur, but somehow he remains performing his duty as Brahma till the end of his life. And then he goes, he enters final final destination, if you want to put it like that. There's there's a place for considering that also. So again, those will be my main two proposals. I don't want to say you pick the one who like you the most or something, but my point is, yeah, some of these topics have not been directly addressed in Shastras, but there is a place for what's called Shastra Yukti, which means like to use our logic and thinking process in the context of what Shastra says. Not first our logic and then quote Shastra to fit your logic, but first Shastra and then use your logic in the context of Shastra, which is a whole different conversation <laughs> that I make in my book. Because sometimes when we speak about certain topics, uh, we try to justify them by invoking our our common sense, which sometimes is not very commonsensical, <laughs> but we think it is. So we bring logic or common sense, which is limited, as we know. Logic, tarka pratishta not says shastra. Through tarka, which means logic, you you go nowhere. That's how it says basically shastra. You go nowhere only by logic. In in terms of matters connected to the absolute, to the divine, which is so way beyond logic as we are seeing these days in in the Brahma Stuti. I mean, Krishna is like inside, outside, in unlimited medium size. Logic collapses in five seconds by hearing those things. So first we have to go through revelation, through Shastra, and then you can exercise your logic in that perimeter, not outside. Outside, Tarko Pratishtana. That issues that are achintya in nature cannot be grasped by logic. You have to go through to take another transrational method. So I don't want to get so struck, but it's an important point in connection to the whole thing. Because we can say, oh, Maharaj, you're speculating with these things that you're saying about Brahma because nobody say that. Yeah, I agree. But speculation, mental speculation, as Sila Prabhupada will call, it basically has to do with you use your head without first going to Shastra. So that's mental speculation. But when you go to Shastra and you use your head to make sense of what Shastra is, is given to you and, and to elaborate and think about that, that's not only something legal <laughs> but something necessary i mean you have a head you have some thinking you have to do something with that so you, there's a place to exercise that in that context indeed the very term of chintya which we were speaking these days and a little bit joking 
about that sometimes because <laughs> speaking especially regarding this achintya button <laughs> that when <laughs> someone asks you something you don't know you know you're like i have the, the, the atomic option we were also speaking about yesterday about atomic bombs and things like that <laughs> so you have the atomic option achintya <laughs> no. so when i like your question no? like how does that brahma remains brahma because it's imperfect what to do i don't know what to say my god achintya bhai. it's achintya <laughs> like stop thinking do not anymore ask those questions that that, that actually show how i do not know what to say so achintya <laughs> End of the question. Next question. <laughs> Achintya means inconceivable, no? but of course, it's a word that can be abused no? because you can just basically promote like shallow thinking or not thinking at all in the name of inconceivability or whatever. But Achintya, Srila Jiva Goswami defines it in the, <clears throat> in, the, in, the in his, I think, <clears throat> Sarva Sambhat, in his commentary on the Sandharvas, I think Paramatma Sandharva, he basically says, Achintya are those things. I mean, something achintya will remain achintya as long as you do not approach chastra. That's that's the official definition of achintya in our sampradaya. What something when when something is inconceivable, he says, when you do not go to shastra. Unless and until you go to shastra, many things will remain inconceivable. But when you go to Shastra, those things that are inconceivable will become conceivable by Shastra's grace and by your application of yukti or logic in the context of Shastra, but not otherwise. Not For me, this is like that, so Shastra must be supporting this somehow. You try to fill some verse and uh, stretch it and accommodate so it fills your logic. That's not the process. That's the opposite way around. So anyhow, some brief words in connection to, to this. So, so there is place for this type of exercise, if you will. Shastra Yukti, mentioned by Rupa Goswami. Exercise our logic in the context of Shastra. <clears throat> Regarding your second question, which I repeated briefly, it's about pride. Or basically, if we can share some words about pride, which is uh, a pretty particular complex reality to deal with <laughs> especially if you officially want to overcome that because if you are not do not care for that pride just swallows your whole existence and you are comfortable with it i mean that creates so much discomfort but <laughs> but you are not concerned about even acknowledging that but if you are a spirit, spiritual practitioner and you know okay that may be one of the many things to to deal with and on many layers, it's not only like, okay, how, tell me what I have to deal with. Yes, but also each one of those situations have so many layers. And many of the, most of the layers probably we don't, we are not even aware of yet. We will be start to discover as we deal with them. <laughs> because in the beginning we may think, okay, I have pride, I know, and I, I acknowledge. But we acknowledge just what we can see at that moment. The level, pride that is like the tip of the ice, as they say. No, <laughs> they say like this, right? Okay, iceberg. iceberg, iceberg, not ice. The tip of the iceberg. So, and and and, and as you realize, oh my God, it was the tip of the iceberg. There is something called iceberg, which lies below this whole surface of stuff, and the tip was just the tip. No, and for me, it was the whole iceberg. <laughs> so, the same, uh, and we shouldn't get discouraged by that, no. So some words about how to deal with pride. Of course, our acharyas have, to begin with, have cautioned us about that, just very strongly, just to to be aware this is not a joke. This is something, again, not to be neurotic also, because we have to create the proper balance of how to say. Pride, is, especially with pride, things so subtle as, as such, because pride is not only some very gross thing, like I will come on in front of you and say, you know what? I'm the best devotee in, in the whole Gaudiya community. And I'm totally convinced. And that's only because of my merit. Sorry, what? Maybe you are. No, 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 no. no, no. no, no. Please do not do not cheat me like that. No. Act as my friend and tell me, no, more. you're going crazy. Please stop doing things. If I will be, I wouldn't be saying those things. <laughs> no. 
And so, but my point is, pride does, is not only that. You know? And of course, here comes the very tricky thing because we sometimes think that pride is certain thing. So whenever that happens, that's pride. And whatever does not happen, that's not pride. But pride or humility, which is would, would be the opposite, it's not something that you can measure externally, that it has a lot to do with what's going on in, internally. And you cannot sometimes see that immediately at least. And you have to take the time to examine and not so much examine other people, but <laughs> because you can also go in life like just, oh, okay, let's see how, how proud they are, how proud he is, she, how humble they are. Mm -hmm. And probably all that exercise is a distraction of what's going, what's taking place at home. And the same thing when we hear these definitions of adhikar in Shastra. Uttam adhikar, kanishta, madhya. This is not just to write your list and start to like scan every person. You are a kanishta. You are also a kanishta. Everyone is a kanishta. It's a... <laughs> <laughs> Except for me. It seems like I am the only one who has the ability to discern who they are. So I'm for sure more than kanishta. But everyone else, this type of, that's not the, the idea. It's more to be introspective and be strict with yourself and merciful with others, if you will. So pride is pretty subtle stuff. Externally, it may seem as humility. You can even, as a devotee, learn how to say, like to play a show of external humility. Like that's a formula and everyone will, without even subconsciously, not even not like wanting to cheat everyone, but subconsciously you resort to that mechanism where you, Jai, Pranam, then there were two of you, and you may think, oh, wow, she's so humble. No. And you can make like an external, like, the more you put your shoulders like this, it's the more humble you are. Like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe internally you are just wanted everyone to think you are humble, basically. Uh, and to convince the environment <laughs> how humble you are, and then to remain in a comfort zone of, I'm humble. So I don't have to work on my pride. But, but pride is is very tricky, you know. And again, it, it it will present itself in even in the disguise of humility and vice versa. Humility may seem to be pride, and not necessarily it's pride. Like the famous story that we share sometimes with with this disciple of Ramanuja Charja, who was uh, he was very capable in all areas of service basically he will like he will sing very beautifully he will cook incredibly he will be he knows shastra so well he will be many 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 virtues and attributes so someday one of some of his god brothers will tell him oh you cook so nicely and he said yes and you sing more better than a gandharva i say yes and you know so well the scriptures he said yes so they were like, oh my God, he's becoming proud. He's taking merit or something, they thought. So they went to, to their guru, Ramanuja Charya, and they were concerned for his good brother and asked and told him them, Guru Dev, it's not that we want to report him, but we are just concerned for our good brother. And every time we are mentioning to him, you do this so nicely, you do this, he say, yes, always, yes, yes. So we are worried that he may engage being proud. So Ramanuja Charis is called him. So he goes and he asks, your god brothers have come to me. They are concerned about you in a healthy way because they say that they ask you, you cook nicely, you say yes, you sing nicely, you say yes, you know Shastra perfectly, you say yes. So you please tell me what's, what's going on. <laughs> and the disciple told, well, Guru Maharaj, if I cook nicely, it's by your mercy. So if I deny the effect of your mercy on me, that wouldn't be proper. I would be ungrateful. So by saying I cook nicely, I'm actually accepting by your grace I cook nicely. And the same with all the other things. Whatever I can do nicely is only by your mercy. So I cannot deny that. So I have to accept that, yes, I cook nicely. By your grace, by Gurudev's grace. You follow my So it seems proud, but it's actual. It's another level of hum humility. So there are levels of as there are levels of humility that can be misconstrued if you don't have proper appreciation. Also, there are levels of pride that can be seen as the opposite if we don't have a, a trained eye. 
So, yeah, someone like Raghunath Das Goswami, for example, in his Manas Shiksha, he will use these like extreme graphic depictions to speak about Pratishta, which are all connected, no pride, like a tigress, like a chandala, crazy woman uh, who whatever eats this and drinks that, and like very like gross, monster like depictions of all these different anarthas for us to, okay. I have to. That's not uh, how to say pleasurable to to deal to have that. What to speak to to maintain them. So, so first of all, this this caution, like this is not a nice thing. So try to acknowledge that. Of course, while while acknowledging that we shouldn't be over identify with that. The fact that I have pride doesn't mean that I am pride. And you yourself say, I have pride. You don't say, I am pride. So in the very root shows that you are not that. No. When you say, I am angry, you don't say, I am anger. <laughs> I am proud, but you don't say, I am pride. No. So I even in the way intuitively how you express yourself, you know that you are not that thing. That's not part of the constitution of the Atma. <laughs> so that's important because if we don't have that clear, we can be really over-identified with that and get neurotic and get depressed and get discouraged and think, I'm such a monster. <laughs> I have no hope whatsoever. And this process is so nice, but I'm so ugly. So this is too much for me. I will stop practicing. That can happen if we don't know how to work with these things and, again, go in the neurotic side, over-identify with our narthas and forgetting how powerful is Mahaprabhu's grace. Mm -hmm. Because no matter how proud you are, you maybe you tell me, Maras, I'm the most proud devotee in the whole world. I will say, yeah, but Mahaprabhu's mercy is more powerful than all your pride put together. I don't know how proud you are, but even if you tell me I'm the most proud person on earth, still Mahaprabhu's mercy is more powerful than your pride. <laughs> now if you tell me, no, my pride is more merciful than Mahaprabhu's great, then you are the most proud person on earth. <laughs> I can give you officially the label. Because if you think that your pride is so great and big and powerful that it's about Mahaprabhu's mercy, you are really proud. But still Mahaprabhu's mercy is more powerful. <laughs> so we will make some pray, chain of prayer for you so Mahaprabhu, <laughs> Nityananda Prabhu especially, can do something about it. So <clears throat> I will say that the, the way, of course there is no magical formula that now I will reveal to you the secret so you can be devoid of pride from now to the next weekend. Uh, that's, that's not happening. No? Hopefully nobody is selling that 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 magical retreat. No? Weekend and leave the weekend without pride or something. But for sure they will have to pay a lot, I'm sure, those type of things. <laughs> In every sense. But... It begins with, with acknowledging the possibility that that thing is there. No? Again, because sometimes we may not even open to that. I mean, some people may not be willing to accept their pride. So that in, in itself speaks about their pride. No? I, I'm not willing that anyone can tell me anything. Only myself. If I see myself, it's okay. That's that's the only way of... That's, that's the world. Like that. So we should be open probably... Some other people is seeing things in me that I'm not seeing. Especially if you are a Gaudiya Vaishnava, <laughs> you have a guru, if you have sadhus around your life, you should trust their vision more than your own vision, with all respect. It's not to downplay you as a person, but just to be realistic and, and, and not be overtly proud to think, I know myself better than anyone else. Not probably, probably not. Probably you are too much engrossed in what you think you are and that makes for being distracted for you from who you actually are and a sadhu will see you for who you are actually for without free from upadis free from designations as the bhagavad gita mentions someone in uh, someone in sattva gun for example will, will be seeing the atma someone in raja gun will be seeing dualistic Perception, mind, uh, man, woman, black, white, race, whatever, political party, and so on. Um, 
And of course, the shadow will see even beyond the atma in the sense we'll see the atma and the potential of the atma in connection to atma. So, so we should be willing to <clears throat> to let the sadhus share their opinion in our lives. So if, if they suggest, mm, maybe this, maybe that, or they are trying to inspire us, please try to be introspective about how pride is, is, is going on in your life. So acknowledgement is important to be open to the possibility that may be happening and to, of course, observe our, observe, observe ourselves. And even if that helps, if we want to give some practical advice, if you will, is, of course, to begin with, try to be close to people that you feel that are more humble than you. And of course, be ready to pay the price of that because that will make your pride come to the surface. And that's why sometimes Sometimes people say, okay, if you go to a sacred place, okay, be ready for that because there may be a contrast in perception because you will be surrounded by so much purity that whatever is not purity will be easily noticed. And it's not that the holy place is bringing impurity. The impurity was there, but you are not seeing that. <laughs> you just needed to contrast that with, with its opposite. And then you see on some level at least what's what. So similarly, that's a good exercise always. If you feel, if you feel, I don't know, I need to work on pride, get closer to those that you feel they are humbler, than, more humble than you. And the very association and way they conduct, you naturally will like, not compare in a neurotic way, but just contrast and, and pay attention how I am dealing with that. Again, not like becoming neurotic. I am not as humble as that pure devotee. And you start to imitate. I'm not saying that, but creating some some contrast is it sheds light on what's actually going on. Because if you are just surrounded by people that is as proud as you or worse, <laughs> you may feel I'm not that proud. <laughs> they are so much proud than me, so I I'm relatively fine. Okay, I'm yeah. In comparison with them, yes. <laughs> but what's the how to say the litmus test, as they say, the thermometer. But you can be complacent in that sense, no? Like, like I don't know. You are a devotee for from, let's say, ten years, and and and, and maybe you should be or twenty years practicing, or or I mean, if you are practicing, because you can. One thing is you were initiated, and other thing is you have been practicing the whole time, and you can tell me. Okay, Maharaj, no, like how to say, mm. I, I I could do it better, but I think I'm okay. I look back 20 years back and I feel that I'm better than 20 years ago. 20 years ago, I was whatever, serial killer or doing some stuff. <laughs> so I will accept, okay, that's great, but that's not the only way to measure your progress because... If not, you can be complacent that whatever you need to, you are called for further progress. You say, no, no, but I'm better than 35 years ago. I, I no longer drink this. I no longer take. Okay, I acknowledge that. But that's not the only way to, to compare and to measure and to make progress. Because if not, you will always remain there because you are, you are always in a better position than you were 30 years ago. <laughs> you follow my point. So you need to put the other way around also to compare with other types of situations or personalities which will, again, not make you neurotic that I'm too fall and I'm too far. This is not for me. I'm not saying that. But association, that's why Rupa Goswami say when he speaks Sadhu Sangha, he describes Sadhu Sangha. Sadhu Sangha should include three uh, ingredients. Snigdasya, Satavara, and Sajatya. Mm -hmm. So... In this case, I'm concentrated on Swatavara. No. Swajatya means of, of, of similar nature. Snigdasi means affectionate. There has to be affection in between. That's the currency. But Swatavara means the sadhu sangha you establish, has to, those sadhus have to be higher than you. No. I mean, you, I'm not saying that every person you relate to in the context of sadhu sangha is higher than you. I mean, one should feel that, <laughs> but but sometimes one one ha one is also relating with people who is 
you will junior or you are more acting like a well-wisher to them, there's place for that relationship. Rupa Goswami mentions that you have to relate with equals. Also, that's that's an interesting challenge. Also, it's another one, but also with people who is higher than you. So that again, that the, the very experience of being and related with someone higher than you doesn't mean just physically physical proximity because sometimes that's not available. But you have to establish some commitment of service in a relationship with people who is higher than you. Check some balances with some higher shadow that is watching over my my progress. And, and, and that has to be voluntary. I have to choose that. I have to decide doing that. It's not that that will be imposed on me. Like you reveal your mind to that person and you send every week how you are doing actually and you share your Facebook password to that sadhu so he can check if you are doing nonsense or not. It, it, it cannot be like <laughs> some dictatorship. But we should feel the, the need naturally. So I, I would like to yeah, keep in touch and, 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 and keep like uh, reporting my inner self to those higher personalities, and as much as I can to be in the in the close proximity, because again, that creates epiphany. That creates moments of revelation when you realize where you are. Not only where he or she is, that, that's a part of that. If you are pro close to your guru for some time, you kind of wow, no, she's he, she's such. But also the other part of the equation is where I am no, in relation to that. Remember, guru is our own potential appearing in front of us. So the logic will be always that I'm with Guru and Guru is showing me all that I can be. So it's in, in, unavoidable that you will feel, oh, I can be all this, I can be all this, but what I am now, but all I can be and what I am now. What I am now, again, not to chastise myself, but just to establish where I am now. I mean, I need to know where I am now <laughs> and as accurate as possible because you have to go know, as my Guru Maharaj says, these two things, where you are now and where do you want to be. So the Guru is the one who clearly shows where do you want to be, all that you can be. And, and by his example, her example, instruction, creates this reflection in us, and where I am now in relation to what I want to be. And what should I do from here to reach here? <laughs> What's the in-between journey? So... Yeah, to deal with pride, basically, again, there's no one single magical formula, and with for every person it may work differently, but basically one has to be under this close company, guidance, open to that, engaging in sadhana, acknowledging that pride may be there. That's for me one of the definitions of anartha nivritti. Anartha nivritti means like getting free from an artist, let's say, in very brief words. But an Arthanibriti is not a practice in, unto itself. You don't practice an Arthanibriti. You engage in bhajan kriya, and that creates an Arthanibriti. So I will say that an Arthanibriti means to engage in bhajan kriya, being aware of the of, of my anarthas, and <laughs> not identified with, but aware of. Because you can practice bhajan, you can engage in bhakti without having this like recognition. There are there is pride in my life, there is in this way, in this stage, this is playing out in this way, and I need to work with so an arthanabriti will be to practice having that awareness. That will create an arthanibriti. Because if you are not aware of your anarth anarthas, how there will be an arthanibriti? <laughs> of course, we could say. In one sense, bhakti is very powerful and, some, and will purify our hearts of things that we are not even aware of. That's, that's also real. But also, it's real that we should do our part as much, as, as best as we can, of trying to recognize the, the field, if you will, what's there. No? We may not be able to see everything. And for sure, Harinam and Sadhana will purify of so many things that we don't have a clue that they are there. And better not to know, it's too much. <laughs> but what we can see, what we can know by our own effort, we should do that 
we should try that. So Pride is in the top five, if you will, of the list, not to say the top one. <laughs> and it's the exact opposite of what does it mean to be a devotee, basically. So basically, that's really unbecoming. I mean, if there is something that does not characterize a devotee, it's pride. If you define a devotee, very thing, first thing you will say mostly is humility. <laughs> no. Sanatana Goswami says humility and prem are synonymous. So basically, he's saying if you want prem, better you're humble. In other words, pride is the worst thing you can do in your prem project. So one has to, yeah, be aware of that, trying to remain close to those who are more advanced than us in, in terms of this particular in, internal process. Try to determine as much as we can which is the version of pride that I'm dealing with in this particular chapter, how it's playing itself out. And when it stops playing itself out in that way, remain attentive. It's not that it disappears completely. It's just now becoming more subtle. And again, not with the mentality, there is some enemy there that wants to defeat, because sometimes we enter into this. I mean, sometimes it's spoken like that to create the proper shatter mood for battling. <laughs> but it's not that pride is some person inside of you that wants, I don't know, some ambassador of Satan or something that wants to make you fall. There's nobody there. It's just that you... You are feeding, you are incorporating some some scars in that particular direction. Like I like to say sometimes when you when you eat and you eat junk food, mm -hmm. so you put junk food into your stomach, and the stomach is chastised by you, basically. <laughs> There's nobody there. There's not one person called stomach, but stomach will react giving you pain. You follow. It's not that the stomach is bad, has something against you. It seems more that you have something against your stomach by giving that junk food. So the same way, the mind is like the stomach of the subtle body. <laughs> so if you feed the mind with junk, some scars, <laughs> the mind will react and the stomach will react. It will give you pain. It will give you, make you go crazy. But it's not that there's somebody there. Mind, subtle body is inert matter. Inert, subtle, psychic matter, but it's still inert. It's not it doesn't have a life of its own. But what's the food you are giving to it? So, pride is part of that junk food, if you will. <laughs> so again, my point is, <clears throat> one has also to develop this type of non-neurotic attitude towards. Okay, pride is there and wants to make me fall and has that intention. No, it's not like that. Is that that you develop certain mechanisms and way of de dealing with reality which are totally toxic and you are just learning how to unfold them. So yeah, pride is on a certain level. You work on that, it will become more subtle. You work on that, it will become more subtle, more subtle till it disappears completely. And in order to finally disappear, it has to become more subtle <laughs> till it disappears. So the other, the other day when one... Vaishnavi, close friend of mine, and she was like asking us, and interestingly, she sent an email, and the, the title of the email said Pride. No? I said, okay, interesting. <laughs> and she was expressing like, okay, I, I'm finding difficulty with pride. And of course, I know the person, and I know that person is not proud. Of course, what does it mean is not proud? No, it's, it's not that it's not proud at in any level, but when you hear someone say, I'm proud, you may think, oh, mm, like showing off. But it's not nothing like that. I know that person is sincere, sadhaka, having very deep realizations, but still feels pride is getting, it's difficult to get rid of. And of course, for me, that's okay. That's part of the result of your bhajan. You're doing it nicely. So you are really realizing how difficult is dealing with pride. I mean, you follow my point, no? that you get to that conclusion doesn't actually mean that you are in a, in the wrong situation, but you are starting to have a glimpse of this, how subtle the things can be. That speaks how much you have eradicated them in your life. Still, they remain maybe on a subtle level, but that shows how much you have transcended all the grossest manifestations of that. So still, 
you are and, and you are willing to acknowledge that and you are asking for help so that shows your humility <laughs> uh, and, and one recommendation that came in the interaction was again that may help for some not for everyone but you can write as we were speaking the day you can write every single day something some meditation some reflection on how you work with pride today how it was your pride struggle today you know how you how you feel you were tested by pride if you will today or you fail by it or you were fa and like a way of bringing to your conscious side those things that sometimes may be inhabiting the subconscious if you follow my point because sometimes all the things pride and so on are there but they are in the background behind the curtains by pu puppeting the whole show moving you without you being aware of that you just think that's me that's my personality that's who i am <laughs> but when you officially say okay let's concentrate in this week or in this month or as long as they feel it necessary on pride or whatever on fear on distrust or whatever or all of them <laughs> maybe maybe pick one so not to be overwhelmed <laughs> And let's bring that, which for sure I know it is on some layer, let's bring that to the, how to say, foreground, to the spotlight. So, and, and you became conscious of that and you make an endeavor, okay, today, pride. What happened today with pride? And you start to think and to reflect, and to bring your attention there. Next day. So that's a way of becoming more conscious of what's actually going on. Because if not... It's not that pride is not there, but it, it, you are just like too distracted to, to deal with that. <laughs> That's one of our problems, distraction. So the solution to distraction is attention. And attention is, you have to discipline yourself sometimes to be at, at, focused on something. It's not, this doesn't happen just by magic. It's not that I tell you, okay, from today on for the next week, be the whole day observing how pride is working. And you may try, but Moments in the day is like shoo, 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 somewhere else. But if you see it, okay, official moment of the day, my 10, 15 minutes of reflection, I will write on this. You kind of force the whole system to focus in that direction. No? So that, that sometimes may work. So anyhow, I mean, we can say so many things, but the rest is practice, no sadhana. I mean, there's nothing that can replace sadhana. No? Sadhana is... And again, sadhana, I do not mean just mechanically doing stuff outside, but just conducting with the proper spirit and the proper need and the proper association. So I hope that helps on some level. <laughs> and you are not alone in, in the struggle, just in case. No? That's an important point because sometimes we can feel so much drowning in an ocean of pride. <laughs> but it's important to understand I'm not the only one drowning here. So <laughs> we are all all drowning together <laughs> of course we are not drowning there's so much help to not drown but sometimes that helps to also deal with the situation in a more ooh, sustainable way go back you have some addition yeah, to the contribution i remember nick for example in Prabhupada's books often there's a term false pride oh yeah and you know so is there and psychologists often say there's something like healthy pride and sometimes I think Guru Maharaj says, like, well, you don't have to be ashamed that you're a devotee. So that's like a kind of healthy pride. Or, so is there, you know, is there, is there anything like healthy pride in, in, in you know, in, in, in Gaudiya tradition, we can say, or in behavior or sadhana? Mm. Like, mm. Or is it just a kind of term? <clears throat> it all depends, as we were speaking yesterday, how, what do you understand by the word? No? Because yeah. you can say pride. And what triggers there is the question, no? because if there is a way that you can see that in a way that there is place for that. I have no problem. I'm just referring to pride as what we usually think of, which as Prabhupada will say, false pride or false ego. Mm. It's kind of, he used the two of them like interchangeable, not like a false sense of, of being or false sense of doership, no? like the Gita says, Prakriti, Yamanani. Hankara bimudra, hankara, the very word hankara means I consider myself the doer and nothing else is influencing me or something. And that's like, that's not who you are really. 
but yeah, Guru Maharaj, for example, he will he will used to say, "We are proud to be humble members of the Bhakti Not Paribar." <laughs> But he immediately ties the word proud to humble. Yeah. <laughs> like to qualify the idea, you know, just to make sure that be careful what you understand by proud. You know? So we are proud to be humbled members of the Bhakti Not So it, 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 in that, in that, and that pride, if you pay attention, what's, what's the meaning of that? Is we feel fortunate to, to have had the, to have the opportunity of having received that, being part of that. And we will take a stance to, what to say, to protect that, to represent that. That even may sound to be, may seem to be proud from the out, outside eye. Like, why do you are acting like? But it's more like confident. Yeah, exactly, no? exactly. And that's an important point that we we spoke yesterday recently with the devotees. One thing is to be confident, another thing is to be proud. Like, for example, famous example is when. <laughs> When Sri Radha knows that in one particular situation, only she can give Krishna the highest pleasure, and he and he needs that, <laughs> she will make herself. He will pull everyone else on the side. And she will appear in the spotlight to provide that pleasure. So again, externally, seems who she thinks she is. I mean, she's putting everyone on the side and just taking the first spotlight position but only with the attitude that at this moment Krishna needs this and I realize that I can only provide that so it's strictly speaking it's full of humility because it's not in consideration of me for me anything coming for me I'm not the center just in the spirit of providing service providing pleasure so it may seem like proud externally but internally it's humility and again the opposite way around your guru may ask the disciple Please do it, do this service, and you may think, "Oh no, no, I'm so falling, I cannot do it." <laughs> That's not humility, because Sila Siamras will say, "Humility in, pra in practice means to follow the instruction." Of course, you have to understand what does it mean. Not, this is not something to abuse, but if your Guru Dev is telling, asking you something, it means that he 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 knows that you will be able to do it. He has faith you will be able to. He's empowering you to do it by by the very act of fact of giving this structure so you kind of tell him oh no we're there i'm so fallen that i won't be able to do that <laughs> do you you don't know how fallen i am so please stop asking me these things because i won't be able to do that's actually pride <laughs> this guy's in itself no so so and so many s similar things in, in in that way so like for example i don't know please can you sing kirtan oh no, I, i'm so fallen i cannot sing that's why you should sing. <laughs> you need to to be redeemed. So we are not. No, you follow my point. Or sometimes I don't know. You are. <laughs> that happens. You are. You are giving the class. Someone makes you give the class, and they put you a, like a fancy seat like this one. No, that is Shriman Mahaprabhu ki yeah. So this fancy seat is there, <laughs> and someone tells you, "Okay, you are. You will speak Harikata. Please sit here." And you may say. Oh, no, no, this seat is too big for me. Uh, of course, what's the reply to that? The seat is not for you. The seat is for the Bhagavata. The seat is for Harikata. You are just an instrument. You follow. So it appeared that you were be humble. Oh, no, it's too big for me. But actually, that's right, because you are thinking, it's for me. <laughs> it's not for you. <laughs> so real humility is, okay, I'm sitting here, but... In the spirit of rendering service, of course, it's your say and done. You, know? you have to really walk the talk internally because you can be sitting and receiving 108 garlands and one puja after another. No, no, only in the spirit of representing the problem. If, if you have the realization, okay, but if you don't have, better you don't do that because it's too much. So this has also to be examined according to yours. You're at the car. You have to be able to determine What's my limit, my capacity to deal with this now, with this level of whatever? That's why Rupa Goswami say one should not accept many disciples, open many temples, or write many books. And when someone asked Prabhupada Bhaktisiddhanta, he was saying that, as you know, he was explaining this. And one disciple told him, But Gurudev, it seems that you are doing exactly the opposite. <laughs> 
opening one temple after another, thousands of disciples, so many books. And he replied, that's a matter, that's a question of personal capacity. Like in playing, what's many disciples? What's many? For some people to have one disciple is many. For some people to be to be a disciple is too much. <laughs> And for other people to have 30,000 disciples, like whatever, Narutam Dastaku or something, it was sustainable. So it's a matter of personal capacity, what is too much or too little. You follow, it's not a fixed number. So you have to pay attention what's your radical. So, so yeah, so the point again, going back to the idea is, yeah, confidence can be mistaken with, with pride, but it's, it's not the same. Actually, there's place for deep confidence with deep humility, like the example of Sri Radha that I gave. And that's the highest form of humility. Because humility, again, in the words of Prabhupada Bhaktisiddhanta, is that which is absent in, in the spirit of enjoyment. In other words, humility means absence of the enjoying spirit. And pride means I see myself at the center, enjoying the spirit. So which external form it will take? There are so many different forms can take. Okay, so, so, so yeah, to be to be confident doesn't mean that you you are confident with you in the center. But I'm so confident, and and that should be part of of saranagati. Saranagati means, for example, rakshi shatiti bishwa so. I have full faith that Krishna will protect me. That's a form of confidence, strong one. If you really believe that, you may be doing things that seem like, who he thinks he is doing that? Why? He thinks he, but maybe the internal feeling is I have full confidence that Krishna is protecting me. And Srila Prabhupada was so confident, so bold. <laughs> For some people, that was shocking. That was like too much. <laughs> but again, it was not like from pride. It was not like it's me, it's about me. But it's about my Gurudev, Mahaprabhu, in service to them. It's not about myself. So as we know, I mean, almost every person on earth, have, if you say Hare Krishna, say, oh, yeah, I have Hare Krishna. You say Prabhupada, maybe not many people will say oh, Prabhupada. So my point is, he wanted the Maha Mantra and the message to be on the floor. He didn't want to be himself in the center. So the, the spirit was that, full humility. So, so there is place for that as well. Okay. Thank you for your question and the contribution. So, what else? There, we have, they're offering the boga now. Yeah, we may have well, time for one more question, maybe. I don't know, any, anyone has some question? Yeah, Karun. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you for the beautiful explanations <clears throat> that you shared with us. I was thinking a little bit in different direction. And um, it's connected with the uh, meditation mm -hmm. in the practice of bhakti mm. and uh, there is a specific case in Bhagavatam there is uh, this verse yet 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 you guys the bhakti that that book from the from bhakti yoga paribhavita yeah. uh, uh, that uh, in the specific way to meditate mm -hmm. Now, he appears in that specific bubble. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I was thinking about Pralat Maharaj mm -hmm. because uh, he's mentioned by all that he was meditating on Krishna. Mm. <laughs> and uh, yeah. afterwards, we see okay, Narasimha Dev appears, mm -hmm. but also. This form of Krishna Narasimha it's more connected generally with Vishnu, mm. not with Krishna. Mm. 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 So this was yeah. because Lakshmi appeared. Mm -hmm. you no, know, it's it's kind of uh, it's uh, pointing to Vishnu. Yeah, yeah. And so I, I was always wondering why. It's... <laughs> yeah, I get the point. I'll repeat the question because they're telling me here that. They cannot hear from the online connection. So here, Tarun Krishna is asking about 
uh, one birth from the Bhagavatam, famous birth, Brahma speaking that birth, third canto, Bhakti Yoga Paribhavita Hritsaroja Sutrakshitapate Nanunatapum Sham and so on, which basically says that according to the, the mood in which one meditates on one sister dev, there will be corresponding reciprocation or Bhagavan will appear in that particular form that one is contemplating one's deity. And the question is, well, what what about Prahlad Maharaj? Because in Shastra it is mentioned that Prahlad Maharaj's sister Dev is not nursing Hadev, but it's Krishna. But we see that and he and, and he, Prahlad, uh, in, in connection to the nine methods of bhakti, he's the personification of smaranam, which means remembrance or meditation, you can say. So he was, I mean, he was engaging in Smarana pretty nicely. He's this, uh, like, I liked the, like the example of that. And his sister Dev is Krishna. But in the Lila that we is most, he is most well known for, it seems that Krishna is not appearing. His sister Dev is not appearing in reciprocation to his remembrance. <laughs> but half man, half life, Narahari is appearing and Tarun Krishna mentioned that after the whole killing of Hiranyagasipu, Lakshmi appears on the scene and the Devas, and it seems more like an Aishwarik, Vishnu like, Vaikuntha like environment, while Prahlad's deity is Krishna. So, how to accommodate this in connection to the Bhagavatam verse, which says, according to how you worship, I reciprocate the court? That's that's an interesting question, and and I've heard that also sometimes. Uh, so it's it's nice also to see when how to say when I say just for you to know when I'm saying oh someone made this question some days ago I'm not chastising any of you for re saying the same question because for sure you didn't know about that, and second, it's it's your own question in your own part of your process, and it coincides with other ones, question, same question in their own process. So for me, it's also interesting to see, okay, how nice, how at se a certain part of each one's journey, certain questions come, and those come from different people in different parts of the world at the same moment, if you will, or something like that. <laughs> so that should happen, that's okay. So what to say, what to say in that connection, of course, again, Pralat's deity is Krishna. Yeah, we are right. It's not Nishimha Dev. But, and, and we should say as Gaudias, and we spoke a little bit about that in our last Gore, no, we, we, the last Narasimha Chaturdasi that we celebrated in, that was North Carolina. And we chose to focus the, the, the topic by speaking about Mahaprabhu, how Nishimha Dev appeared through Mahaprabhu so many times in the Lila, in the Gore Lila. Because we try to go to all the things through Mahaprabhu, who is our Istadev in the Kodiya Sampradaya. And, uh, and the conclusion was that, in one sense, Ma Ma Nishrim Hadev is one aspect of Mahaprabhu. Of course, Nishrim Hadev can be related to Vishnu and the avatars and Das avatars. But ultimately, if we, as Gaudias, uh, play out the implications of our main line, Krishna is still Bhagavan Soya. As we were speaking these days in Brahma Stuti, Vishnu is an aspect of Krishna. So Narasimha Dev is an aspect. If you want, if you want to think Narasimha Dev is an aspect of Vishnu, ambition is an aspect of Krishna. Narasimha Dev is an aspect of Krishna, or an aspect of an aspect. So it's still Krishna, but appearing in a very unique way. according to the necessity of the moment also. Not because the bigger, the bigger picture is Hiranyagashipu, pray to Brahma, give me mortality. I cannot give you that, as we know Brahma say. <laughs> so at least may I not be killed on heaven, on earth, during the day, during the night, all this long contract, list of conditions. And Brahma was like, it won't happen. You will be killed nonetheless, but okay. Okay, Mark, you, you, you got it, you got it, you got it, you got it. You got it. So for Brahma's promise not to be broken, we know Bhagavan appeared in a very specific form, so Brahma's promise is kept, and Viranika Shupu is killed. And, and, and there was a need for it. Again, there's a bigger picture and a bigger picture, because even bigger picture is what? Narayan wants to taste Vira Rasa, 
in by Conta, he wants to take the chivalry mode to have a good fight. <laughs> That's part of Rasa. But he can only experience Rasa with his devotees. But in Vaikuntha, nobody will be ready to fight with Naraya. I imagine. Everyone is mostly in Santa Rasa. Or some Dasya Rasa. Imagine Naraya and Khan say, come on, come. <laughs> <laughs> Let's come to the wrestling arena for arms. It won't work. For the psychology of Vaikuntha, they will collapse. <laughs> Vaikuntha will have to change his name. Vaikuntha means without anxiety. Everyone will be in anxiety if Narayan starts to invite everyone. Let's have some rest. But he wanted to taste that. So Jai, as we know, Jai and Bijai felt we want to facilitate that. We want to offer ourselves for that to happen. And of course, the whole thing had to... So many layers of Leelas happened for facilitate that. No? Kumars come, Jai, Bijai curse falling from Vaikuntha, quote-unquote, nobody mm -hmm. falls from there. <laughs> and they have to appear as, 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 as demons to facilitate the situation and in the context of that, the promise of Brahma. So my point is, all this is part of the, the necessity for Narayan to taste that. But And Prahlad appears in between the picture of the whole Lila, but Prahlad is a Krishna Bhakta, he's not the Vishnu Bhakta. So when he's seeing Narasimha Dev, he's not seeing Vishnu. He's not even seeing Nishrimhadev. He's seeing Krishna. He's seeing his deity. We are seeing Nishrimhadev. Hiranyakasipu is seeing Nishrimhadev for sure. <laughs> Death personified. But Prahlad is seeing Krishna. This is a very example of famous example of the birth of the many things we could say in that connection. According to your bhav, you will perceive the same person differently. That's how Krishna is defined as a multifaceted jewel. When Krishna entered, the the, the 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 wrestling arena. There is a famous verse: Malanam asiranam ninam narabaram sutrinam narod murti mam and so on, which shows how different people saw Krishna in different ways according to their rasa. And there, the the whole range of rasa is described: five main rasas and seven secondary rasas. So, for the woman, Krishna was the cupid personified. For the Brajavasis, he was his relative. For Kansa, he was death personified. The same person. So try to get this one. That's a pretty different subjective experience. Cupid personified, that personified. <laughs> Technically speaking, two different persons are there, but coming from the same person. You follow. No? Brishni, Paradi, Bhatiti. For the Brishnis, he was their deity. <clears throat> and, and so on. So, so my point is the same person is there. But so many different perspectives are there. So again, someone may say, oh, Nishimhadev broke the pillar and is killing Aranyagasya. But Prahlad Maharaj is saying, seeing Krishna. And, and, and his love, particular love for Krishna is being experienced at that moment. Like what we were saying the other day, when Krishna in the Brahma Bimohan Lila, he expanded that as his friends, his calves. It was still Krishna, but in another form. So everyone loved those kids and calves like they love Krishna. Even though it was not in the form of Krishna, it was in the form of a calf. <laughs> but they loved the cows had for the calves was the love they have for Krishna. So they still were having the same experience of love for Krishna, for a calf. You follow my point? And Balaram himself, as we mentioned at the end of the year, was like, not only surprised they are loving all of their calves more than Krishna. This is something weird. The mothers are loving their kids more than Krishna. That should be happening. But he himself was feeling that. He was still feeling, I'm so attracted to these calves. Like if they were Krishna. I love them like I love Krishna. Because of course it was Krishna. <laughs> Brahma didn't know. I love these kids. Like I used to love Krishna. So the point is, no matter what form Krishna takes, be it Narasimha Dev, a calf, a friend, <laughs> if you have a particular relationship with him, whenever he appears in whatever form, you will be feeling that. So for other people, it may be something else, as we see with Iranya Kasipu. And, and then, yeah, Lakshmi may come. And, and again, the point comes there. Lakshmi comes. All this is to, to, to show light on the love of Prahlad, actually. The, 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 the big main character of the whole Nishim Halila is Prahlad. Shinha Deva appeared for five minutes 
deals with Irania Kashipu and game over. But Prahlad Maharaj <laughs> is the one who is you know, highlighted through the whole seventh cant of the Bhagavatam. And when Irani Kashipu is killed, as we know, Nushimha Dev is in Ugra uh, Bhav, basically, angry mood, because he just killed the very personification of sin. So he has he had to enter into that dynamic. <laughs> And the devas come there and they are praising oh Bhagavan more in Vishnu like terms, Aishwarya. But nobody nobody's well, nobody I mean they praise for a considerable distance. <laughs> no? Generally by contact there is awe and reverence. Now there's more awe and reverence, no? more distance than even in Baikunta, because Vishnu is in for them, Vishnu appeared in such a ferocious way that we never saw him like that. And Lakshmi Devi herself will say, I never saw him like that. What's going on? And, and they are afraid to get close to him, especially the devas. Because as my Guru Mahārāj says, the devas personify sakam bhakta, bhakti. Bhakti, but still with material desires. And Nrsimha is the personification of killing material desires. So if you have material desires and you have the personification of killing that, you're like... Oh, I don't know if I will. I want to go too close to that. <laughs> so all this is not so much to show everyone is in Vishnu Aishwarya like mood, but to make the position and contrast with how Prahlad Maharaj feels and how Prahlad Maharaj feels. Everyone is afraid. Everyone is nervous. What to do? And nobody wants to get closer to pacify Nishrima Dev, and they look at Prahlad. Oh, Prahlad. <laughs> <laughs> you are our last resource, no? our last option. Please go. And Prahlad Maharaj is, has no problem. I mean, Prahlad Maharaj was all time like absorbing, remembering, and praising Krishna. He was not seeing there is a angry lion man there that may kill me or anything. He's he's seeing beyond that through the lens of his Baba and seeing his beloved Krishna. And so when someone says Please go to him. Prahlad says, yeah, of course. He goes walking and he jumps on the lap, on his lap. I mean, on the same lap that his father was killed a few minutes ago. You know? So you say, the last place you want to jump to a lion is the lap. But he's not seeing lion. He's not seeing lap. He's seeing Maista there. And he jumps there and immediately, with the contact of Prahlad, Nusrim Hadeb starts like, to lick you know, Prahlad like, like if he will be a kitten. Ugra and Nishrina did disappear completely. So, so to make this point of Prahlad was in another frequency and, and, and he was the only one able to I mean he, he was again seeing something in particular but his frequency was such that he even changed the mood of Ugra and Nishrina and, and, and the eyes of everyone else because he was connected to another aspect of divinity which is Krishna which has more to do with charm and intimacy and love so for Prahlad that was the currency so naturally that was he even make that Vishnu side in the eyes of other ones like change and become totally mm. <laughs> <laughs> and then of course we have all these prayers and so on so so I, I will explain it like that no basically no so in Prahlad's eyes there's there was never Vishnu basically there was never Nishrima Dev, no, it was only Krishna. No, that, 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 that's yeah, the subjective perception through the lens of, of, of Baba. Mm -hmm. So according to one's, going back to the Bhagavatam verse, yeah, according to one's in, internal disposition, Bhagavan will show accordingly. So that, I mean, there's no contradiction with the verse. No, Prahlad has an internal disposition. Mm -hmm. Bhagavan show him accordingly, so to him accordingly. But how Bhagavan showed to him, maybe we are not seeing that. We are just sharing a more general depiction of what appeared in the lens of Mos, in the lens of Hiranya Kashipu, for sure. <laughs> and that's the very idea of the whole Lila, no? because Hiranya Kashipu will say, I'm not seeing your God. And Prahlad say, say, like, where is your God? And Prahlad will say, where is my God not? He's everywhere. So the point is this, he's seeing something that... Everyone else is not seeing. <laughs> so even when he appears, not because Viranya Gachipu will say, I'm not seeing your God. So Mr. Nikhil will say, here I am. <laughs> so now 
Iran and Kashipul can say, okay, now I'm seeing it. I'm seeing what you are seeing, but still he's not seeing what Prahlad is saying. <laughs> he's seeing a particular form that Bhagavan will take according to what Iran and Kashipul needs to see and needs to deal with. Again, remember, this is one of Jaya Bijaya. He needs to have a good fight, so he cannot have a good fight with with what Prahlad Maharaj is seeing. <laughs> Because also Prahlad Maharaj's mood is Santa Bhav, so it's more peaceful mood. But remember, Narayan wants to have a good fight. So he even cannot... <laughs> the, the deity of Prahlad, what Prahlad is seeing is not a deity that will offer a nice wrestling. No? So Irani Kasipu is seeing something that lends itself to towards arm to arm, neck to neck, all these dynamics. And even if you want to take that further, technically speaking, yeah, anyhow, that's another topic. <laughs> I'm going too far now. So that, I think that, that that's, that's, that's a good point to make, so, a good question. So hope that helps. Thank you so much. Okay, so I think we will finish here. And tomorrow we will have, today we have at, at the same time in the evening, 6.30 Bulgarian time, Brahma Stuti for those who would like to come and tomorrow in the morning we have Brahma Stuti in the morning and at 5 p.m. Bulgarian time we have another series of Q&A uh, in, in Taran's place that will be the last program here in Bulgaria Monday morning we are I'm leaving to Finland so thank you so much for your time Sri Lagurudev Ki Jai Sriman Mahaprabhu Ki Jai Sri Harinam Sankirtan Jai Giriraj Maharaj ki jai Sri Sri Jagannath Baladev Subhadra ki jai Sri Kadas ki jai Gaur Bhakta Bind ki jai Gaur Premanan Hari Vanchakal Patarubya Chakriva Sindhu Deva Chapati Tanam Pavane Pyo Vaishna Vipya Namon Ananta Koti Vaishna Vrind ki jai Gaur Hari Gaur Jai